7 a.m. Tuesday. It was precisely at this moment that the river gauge reached 24 feet and the muddy waters began sliding over the downtown levee and into Monument Avenue, just a few dozen yards east of the Main Street Bridge. Hundreds of spectators watched as if transfixed as the water flowed over the levee top and down the slope. They shouldn't have been taken by surprise, but they were. One moment, they were watching a drifting boat coming toward them with a man in it, waving for help, and the next moment, the city was flooding. It was just too staggering a fact to register immediately. One man standing close to the overflow spot put his foot sideways across the flow, as if this might stop it, then drew it back embarrassedly. If 15 seconds the trickle became a stream, in, in 15 seconds the tri trickle became a stream, and the stream a torrent, pulling along with it the turf and gravel, mud and stones of which the levee was constructed, and then a woman screamed piercingly. It broke the spell. The levee's bustin', a man shouted hoarsely. There followed then an almost slapstick exodus. Men, women, and children ran, slid, and tumbled down the levee, jumped into buggies or autos or onto horses, or ran as fast as their legs could carry them, south on Jefferson and Main Streets. Some leaped onto and clung desperately to the sides of wagons and autos pulling away. The runners led for a moment with lithe youngsters and men in the van, followed by women dragging children. No one showed any concern about anything except getting himself away. The horsemen and buggies and autos soon caught up to the runners, nudging them gently out of the way at first and then bowling them over deliberately when they didn't respond fast enough. Dozens slipped and fell and were trampled on by others, and yet, miraculously, all regained their feet and continued this frenzied run. Almost as if confused, the water spread out and slowed at the base of the levee, and then, as the gap at the top widened, began filling the streets following the disappearing pedestrians into the heart of the downtown area, catching up with them swiftly until within minutes they were running in water over their shoe tops, ankle deep, then mid calf deep. And now the realization that they couldn't outrun it hit them and they took to the buildings, seeking shelter in stores and shops and residences wherever they happened to be. Before 10 minutes had passed, the streets were virtually devoid of life, with only an occasional distant horseman seeking higher ground. Within 45 minutes, the water was three feet deep and was rolling abandoned autos along with the current, returning them broadside and tipping them over. It poured down the main thoroughfares toward the south to join with the canal and continued toward the bend in the river below the city. When it reached 4th and Main Streets, where there was a great excavation for the proposed Elder and Johnston store, the water poured over the rim like a giant cataract and filled it up in a matter of minutes, then continued southward. Another great break of the levee had occurred ten minutes before at Steel Dam, pouring the waters of the Great Miami into Riverdale, and others had occurred near 4th Street, flooding Edgemont and the west side and near William Street on Wolf Creek, flooding Broadway, and the near west side, the time of terror was at hand. Tuesday, 7.15 a.m. Several hundred yards downstream from where the Stillwater River empties into the Great Miami River is Steel Dam. 
At most times, it is plainly visible, a con concrete roller dam rising 11 feet from a riverbed. Now, however, except for a viciously rolling swirl of water above where it was located, there was no indication of the dam's presence. The water level had risen foot after foot until the dam just disappeared beneath it and then continued rising until it left at the very edge of the high levee of the west bank which shielded Riverdale. At 6.50 a.m., the first trickles of water had eased over the top and almost immediately a relatively small crack appeared which rapidly washed out and became a larger split of gushing water. Within five minutes, it spread over more. It spread even more, growing to a depth of six feet and a foot wide, with a fantastically powerful jet of water spurting through it. More of the earth crumbled and still more. And now, 25 minutes after the first water had gone over the top, a huge section of the levee was pushed out leaving behind a gaping hole 50 feet wide and 18 feet deep. Now it was no longer merely a leak. A monstrous volume of water poured into the residential area and followed Great Miami Boulevard southwestward toward McKinley Park, where once again it would join with the main river body and thus circumvent the almost 90 degree bend in the stream bed. The wave of murky water rushed across Main Street with a hideous, swishing gurgle, tumbling garbage cans, ripping out gates and fences, shoving houses from their foundations. Down the slightly inclined boulevard, it swept past Herman Avenue and Fulmer Street, where it entered McKinley Park and spread out in a vast liquid blanket. Some of the frightened people in the windows of the homes around which the water swirled remembered now the man who had come by knocking frantically on their doors at 4 a.m., warning them of an approaching flood, and they wished they had paid heed. Some merely watched with a paralysis of fear gripping them, but others acted, snatched up their children, waded across the city park to the steeply rising Belmont Hill on the other side. These were in the minority, however, and all too quickly it became too late to do even this as the water reached three feet, then four, then five within an hour. Half a thousand people clus clustered on Belmont Hill and saw the churning water in McKinley Park rise along the lame street levee and cover it, joining with the main river body again, and except for the occasionally toppling trees, making it appear that McKinley Park had never been anything except a great river. The small buildings went first, a shed here, a garage there, a doghouse or a porch ripping away from their foundations bobbing along at crazily canted ankles on the surface, being hurled with great pressure against the strong Dayton View Bridge. There were living creatures riding this torrent, too, such as the dozen forlorn chickens perched on the roof of a hen house that shot past. Enough horses went by at intervals, whinnying and screaming in terror to have filled a large stable only to disappear when they slammed into the big bridge. The residents on the east side of the park moved swiftly from the first floors to the second, and from there out onto the roofs or into attics, and it seemed to them that the water would never stop rising. For a long time, it didn't. 7.32 a.m. Tuesday. George Walter McClintock yawned. 
feeling the grit of weariness behind his eyes, and glad his run was nearly finished. The engineer from Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton Railroad, he had pulled his train out of the Dayton Terminal at 11 p.m. yesterday, towing 28 loaded boxcars. He should have been back in Dayton three hours ago, but irksome delays in both Hamilton and Cincinnati had thrown him off schedule. Now pulling out of the CH and D yards in Xenia, a half hour run from the company's loading depot in Dayton, he felt depressed and anxious for a hot bath and bed. A big, blonde, genial man of 38, he had been the brunt of too many jokes about late trains, and it had become a point of personal satisfaction with him to keep his own train on schedule. The persistent rain didn't help lighten his feelings, and he leaned glumly on the throttle watching the track ahead in the gloomy morning light. Xenia wasn't ten minutes behind when a movement far ahead at the Trabine crossing caught his eye. It was a man waving a jacket frantically at him, while another man stood beside a wagon and team in the road, steadying the nervous horses. There were two metal boats in the wagon and eight others piled beside the road. McClintock applied the brakes and automatically pulled his heavy silver watch from from the pocket of his blue striped railroad coveralls. It was 7.32 a.m. The engine gave a hissing wheeze as it stopped, and McClintock leaned from the cab window to watch the man scramble through the cinders toward him. What's wrong? he called. Dayton's got hit by a flood. The man was panting from his exertions. Hit bad. Levy's done busted. About seven o'clock, and it's getting worse all the time. They're going to need boats bad, and we can take more than three. We can't take more than three in this rig. Got room for them? McClintock didn't waste time with unnecessary questions. Third car back, he said. I'll pull up so we can load him. To himself, he muttered, and I never believed in dreams before. Never. In less than two minutes, they were loading the boats and their oars into one of the empty boxcars. McClintock and several of the train's crew gave a hand. I'm O'Connor, said the man who flagged him down. Mike O'Connor. Live in Xenia, he grunted as they lifted another of the boats into the car. Me and Mel Fruits here, we work for DNX Traction. Wouldn't have known, wouldn't have known about the flood, except when we stopped here in Trayvon for some coffee, and I called my sister in Dayton. That was just after it happened. Guess the levee's done busted in two, three places. Me and Mel here, we remembered Otto Bond's boatyard up the street. Told him about it, and he said to take them. All ten of them. We just got done lugging them to the crossing when you came. McClintock nodded approvingly, but his face was grim. His house was in a low area on Perry Street near Franklin, a few blocks from Union Station, and only a block from the river levee. Wonder if the water's reached the station yet, he asked the question more of himself than of O'Connor. Probably not. Mel Fruits put in. Tracks are set pretty high, but if, if it's flooding as fast as Mike says, we won't have any time to waste. He turned to O'Connor. Mike, you take the team and wagon back to Xenia. I'll ride on in with the train. O'Connor nodded, and Fruits clambered up into the path behind McClintock. The other members of the train crew scrambled back aboard and the train was already moving before some of them made it. <laughs> in, the cl in the cab, McClintock pulled the throttle all the way back and the wheels spun noisily on the tracks. In seconds, they were barreling towards Dayton.